Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. A very warm welcome to everybody that's managed to come. It's difficult, isn't it, with uh, these COVID restrictions? Uh, sadly, that's what we're up against, but we make the most of these situations. So a very warm welcome to family and friends of Hilda, and uh, also um, Stephen from Claiborne too, uh, the care home that she was at in the last few years of her life. We're here to give thanks, aren't we, to the Lord for the long life that he gave Hilda Cook, 95 years. It's an amazing thing, that gift of longevity. So we're going to begin by a video song, uh, How Great Thou Art, we're unable sadly to sing. If you'd like to stand and um, just, uh, I don't know, hum along in your mask or whatever, but, uh, or just focus on the words, How Great Thou Art. We shall, let, let us stand and uh, read the words of this hymn and listen to the music. And then Martin will come and give a tribute. Consider all the works thy hand hath made. I see the stars, I hear the mighty thunder. Thy help throughout the Sings my soul.
Martin, if you'd like to give a trip. Thanks, uh, Simon. It's just as well you told us not to sing, because it's like an automatic reflex. You stand up and you, <laughs> you yeah, sing, don't you? Um, as many of you know, um, my brother, our brother Jeff, lives in Australia, and unfortunately at the moment it's very difficult to get in and out of Australia. But he sent me some thoughts, and this is what he says. I know that I grew up feeling secure and never feeling for one minute that mum and dad wouldn't be there for me. We had our issues, of course, as everyone does, but it's only as I grew older that I realized how lucky we were. As I see so many families that argue and split up and family members who don't talk, I realize that our family's bedrock was mum and dad. We were uh, brought up on a council estate. My mum and dad's first home, I think, was in Hanley. Um, but we were brought up in Snake Grain. Um, and it was still in the process of being built at the, that time. So it was a bit of a building site. Um, so we could roam. And um, there were no fences around buildings at that time. So you could uh, do all sorts of naughty things. But mum let us roam. And we'd be off all day. And if the weather was OK, she wouldn't know where we were until we decided to go back home. Then in 1966, Mum and Dad managed to put down a deposit on a house in Shelton, just along the road here, on Corden Road. We had no phones, there were no mobiles, and there were no landlines. Or the, or the people had landlines, but we didn't. And we had no car. In fact, Mum and Dad still had a black and white TV into the 90s. I think they both liked the reminder of the silver screen of the pictures. I can remember the very first episode of Coronation Street. Anybody else remember that? <laughs> um, which was a favorite with mum, so we couldn't watch anything else because if the telly was on ITV, that was it. You couldn't watch BBC. And she might not exactly have identified with uh, Elsie Tanner, Ina Sharples, and Annie Walker, but I think she certainly understood the type one of her favourite expressions was, you daft apeth. The only time I can remember Mum not being at home with us was when my brother Jeff was born. He was a blue baby and he needed a complete transfusion. So we were in the hospital for a week or so. Now Hilda Garside, as was, was the fifth of six children of Annie and Sam Garside, Harry, Fred, Annie, Sally, Hilda, and Roy. Uh, and they lived on Plough Street in Hanley, which I think is still there. But the terrace houses are all gone. Um, all, all her generation are gone now. She was the last. She went to Broom Street Juniors and Glass Street Senior Girls School she loved school, but when war broke out in 1939, she missed being in the top class and left school at 13, which was a bit of a disappointment for her. But her first job was in the turning shop at McIntyre's, which produced, I think, electrical porcelain insulation doodars. We don't know. We, we, tried to, we tried to find out what it was exactly. I don't think actually mum knew what it was. Um, what she was producing, but she was called the Cartridge Queen as she was the fastest. In 1945, the end of the war, when she was 19, she joined the WAFs, the Women's Auxiliary Air Force, and she worked in the post offices in various camps. She then applied to go overseas and spent time in Egypt and Aden, Aden is what's now called Yemen. She loved traveling, found it difficult when she had to settle back into civilian life. 
After being demobbed, she joined the RF, RAF Association, where she met Howard. He was still in the RAF, so they had to court by post. They married in 1951, and in 2001, celebrated their golden wedding. Dad died in 2002, and I think Simon was officiating at that. We were here. And um, in the meantime, they had four children, ten grandchildren, and seven great-grandchildren. I want to leave the last word uh, to Amy, because she was the most frequent visitor at Claiborne for my mum. And this is what Amy says. She loved to have a good chat and was happy to talk to anyone about anything. She was genuinely interested in everyone, which often led her to abandoning her visitors when someone more interesting came along. <laughs> she became increasingly confused about who was who, but still loved to show off to the other residents about husband, brother, sister, daughter, didn't matter. Amy was sometimes sister, sometimes daughter. She loved the little great-grandchildren and had a good chatter with them about non nothing at all uh, or asked the same question ten, ten times in the same half hour. Do you like school? And what are you going to do when you leave school? Do you like school? And so on. And the carers at Claiborne described her as a character which Amy always thought was a polite way of saying she was a bit of a pain in the aspidistra. <laughs> a, bit of a, a bit of cheek enjoyed being mischievous. She could wind people up and be coldly sarcastic. She was stubborn and independent and would let you know. Good. Um, let's just have a moment of prayer and give thanks for Hilda's life. Father, we thank you for the good and long life that you gave Hilda. Thank you that she was dear to many of us, and especially those here and those perhaps watching online as well. Um, we thank you too for Howard. Uh, her husband beforehand. Uh, we became fo very fond of them both. They were very much a part of church here. Lord, we thank you for Hilda. We thank you for the, uh, the impression, the presence that she's left with many who knew her and loved her. Um, thank you for the fun that she was. Thank you for the interest she took in people. And thank you, Lord, that she was with us for so long. Lord, we also pray that you would um, comfort those who are bereaved right now, um, those that have lost a mum or a gran. Lord, we just pray that you would um, draw near to them in a very special way. Um, it come, there comes a moment where we all pass from this life, but nevertheless, it's always difficult, and it's a parting, and there is grief, and there is sorrow. But Lord, we know that you're the God of all comfort. We know that the comfort we received also we can use to comfort others. But Lord, I just pray that you would draw near to each and every one that is mourning the loss of Hilda in whatever way here today. And we pray that you would comfort them and show yourselves to them. In Jesus' name, amen. So Jan is now going to give testimony and... Um, then we will hear a song by Lydia Cook um, on video. Eyes on the Sparrow, that's called. But Jan, over to you. Hi, thank you. Um, Martin asked me if I'd fill in any gaps. Um, but uh, I just wanted really to, to give testimony to the way in which God took care of my mum and us, really. Uh, particularly in the last years. But looking through my mum's papers, as Martin says, she joined the WAF after the war. This was something she really wanted to do. And I found in her papers 
that they'd um, said uh, on leaving the WAF that her character was classed as very good, which apparently was the highest award that could be given, and that her proficiency was superior. And it seemed to me to sum up um, my mom that she was proficient and superior uh, in whatever she did, she did to the best of her ability. Um, as Martin said at McIntyre's, she was dubbed the cartridge queen. She did say to me, she didn't even know what they were that she was making, it was something for the war. Um, but because she was so fast, she got this rec recognition. And um, she was always meticulous and punctual and organized. Um, and quite strict, and um, she made a plan to try and um, get her, her own home, and uh, she took a risk in renting a um, house that was going to be condemned in Hanley. Everybody thought they were crazy, um, but in the two years that she was there, she paid over her rent each week, and at the end of it, it was hers. And she was able to put that money away when the council bought that house off her. And uh, she uh, then saved up by going to work each evening when my dad got home and saved up to buy at the princely sum of £2,500 the, the house in Calden Road. Well, you perhaps know all that. But after Dad retired, she and Dad got involved in lots of different things, the post office veterans, they were walking, Mum went swimming, she did painting, crochet, sewing, learning to type. She was uh, always doing something, always busy, so much so that my dad, when he was ill, was saying, yes, she looks after me meticulously, but she's never there, never around. And um, that's how she was, independent, stubborn to the end. When I suggested, when she wasn't um, very well, that she come and live with us, I um, got a, a negative reply in no uncertain terms that I couldn't tell her what to do. So, nevertheless, it was a difficult decision when we, Dave and I, decided to go to South Africa and wondering, was this a good idea, you know, leaving behind family and particularly mom? But on the very day that we were leaving, the Lord said, may the Lord keep watch between you and me when we were away from each other. And we just felt that was God saying that he was going to take care of her while we were away. He would be there for her. And um, that's really what I wanted to tell you about because this time... Um, we decided to come back to the UK despite all the restrictions, despite corona, because um, I wanted, obviously, to be with my mum. But they were saying she wasn't well. We, we knew we had to go into quarantine. We weren't sure whether we would be back in time, whether we would even see her, but we decided we would come anyway. And um, we got back on Saturday the 12th of December, and on Sunday the 13th, we got a call from Claiborne saying, come, I th we think we would like to see her. She may not have much longer. Now, the week before we'd come, we'd looked at the government restrictions, and it had said um, there's only two reasons for breaking quarantine. One is if you're a key worker. One is if you um, are having a serious operation. So people were saying, surely, you know, they'll make an exception in this case. But no, the, re the government website said you couldn't um, visit. But on the 12th, after Claiborne had rung, Dave looked it up on the website. And a third um, category had been added. And it said that um, you could visit dying uh, relatives. Uh, it hadn't been there the week before, but the government had uh, introduced it that week. And so we were like, yeah, we can go. And also, um, because we were going into quarantine, 
we thought, well, we won't need a car. Um, so we tried to take the car back to the uh, hire company, but they weren't open over the weekend, and they said, you'll have to keep, keep it a day longer. So that meant we had a car. So we were able to go up to Claiborne, and I was actually with my mum a few hours before she died. Now, I, I just believe that that's not a, a coincidence that God was in that, that he was working out the details. The fact that we were able to come um, when there's been so many closures of borders and all the rest of it, the fact that we arrived the day before, the fact that the government changed the uh, restrictions uh, within that week, the fact that we had the car, all those things to me were saying, I'm in control, God's in control, He's going to take care of the details. And we just found that throughout the time that we were away, and mum was at Claiborne, that God was just taking care of my mum. The Bible says um, uh, that we read quite often that the very numbers on our, hair, on our head are numbered. The very hairs on our head are numbered. Um, he says, don't worry about your life, what you'll wear and what you'll eat. He takes care of the details. And no word from God will fail. And God has certainly been faithful. And in these uncertain times, when we don't know what tomorrow holds, I'm confident that God is faithful. Friends sometimes let us down. People die. People in our family even die. But God never let us down. And he took care of my mom. He got her into Claiborne in the first place when there was a waiting list at the time of five people before her. Um, but when the time came, uh, everybody had either gone somewhere else, no longer wanted to come, or they weren't ready. And so mum got a place there, and uh, she was cared for so well there. And I, I think throughout her life, um, Mum won't go down in the history books, but she cared for her family. And at the end of the day, isn't that what's important? That love is the important thing. And I think that all the things she did for us was the way in which she showed her love. She wasn't demonstrative about it, but nevertheless, she showed her love by the way that she acted the way she was always there for us. And at the end of the day, we can do all sorts of things. But in the end, the only thing that remains is love. And so that's how I would like to remember my mom, that she loved us to the end. Um, thank you. Thank you, Jan. It's amazing, isn't it? Many of us can testify how God engineers events and works his will through all sorts of things and does some miracles, really. Um, uh, the fact that the Lord knows all the hairs on our head is not too difficult for you to know how many are on mine. <laughs> Zero. <laughs> but it is an incredible thing. And this song coming up uh, reflects something similar, that... Uh, not one sparrow will fall to the ground, Jesus says, unless the Father knows about it. And this song reflects that truth. Sung by Hilda, it's on video. Uh, we'll remain seated as we, the eye on the sparrow. Thank you.
watches over me. so much for that song. It was brilliant. Um, Stephen Foley, um, chaplain from Claiborne, is now going to also give us some thoughts. So come up here, Stephen. Thank you very much. And, yeah. Uh, my name's Steve Foley, I'm the chaplain at uh, Claiborne, uh, and it's uh, been a great privilege of the, the years I've been there, um, to just to help to, uh, to bring light, really, in, into a, sometimes a difficult situation, and certainly this year. Uh, but Hilda was part of a, a very special generation, uh, and I think we've already heard from the uh, from the tributes, from the testimony of, of the solidity uh, of that generation. Uh, and their values are very much what we need today. Uh, and so it's, it, it, is, it, it is wonderful. It's wonderful. And, and one of, the, one of the, the things I've been able to do o over this last year is to just remind people that we may be separated from relatives, we may be separated from uh, loved ones, but we are never separated from the love of God. And he's been a constant present that presence there. Uh, and we've had, uh, we've had many uh, wonderful times. And, and, and I think it's been up, uh, uplifting for, for the staff too. But Hilda, Hilda herself was... Um, and I would, I would have to describe her as a character. Um, but a wonderful character because... You know, we, you, you, she clearly embraced life. I mean, you, you all will have known her for a lot longer than I have. It, it's quite a short uh, message that I've got. But uh, she was very special, and, and all of the staff were very, very fond of her. Um, there's one or two stories. I'm, I'm probably only going to share one from the, the staff, because I could be here for a long time. Um, but, yes, she could be uh, occasionally... Um, a little bit cantankerous, shall we say. Um, but she had such a, a wit, and, so, and she was very sharp. And, yes, yeah, sometimes she could be cutting. Um, you know, one of them was saying to me, you know, one day I went in, uh, you know, to get her up in the morning, and she said, uh, oh, I do love you. And she said, uh, the next time I went in, the next day, she said, how can you be so stupid? <laughs> And he said, well, that, that was her, you know, and, and so she, but there was this character shone through. Um, but the one thing, thing she did, almost to the end, really, was to, to embrace any, any form of activity, whether it was, I mean, she loved to read. She was always reading something. Uh, she really was an avid reader, but, um, you know, if it was flower arranging, if it was some kind of singing, if it was listening to music, she'd be there conducting the orchestra. Um, she'd be humming, humming along if she didn't know the words or singing. 
Um, and so she, you, you were very aware of her, you know, but it was in a, in a very good way. Uh, and she was part of, of, of the family, really, there. Many of the, uh, the care staff and Kerry, you know, the manager, often says that they, they spend longer with, with the residents than their own families and become very attached. Um, but, you know, she was... She, she, you know, she, she did have this great sense of humour, and I think that was the, that was the thing that, it, because of everything else, you know, you, you couldn't help but love her, really. Um, but I often wonder, you know, when, because we haven't seen a resident and, until they get some form of dementia, and, and for most, they can't fully explain. And, and when you hear the, you know, the fullness of life it, that she had, it doesn't, it doesn't surprise me one bit. Uh, and, um, and, you know, it was, it was interesting, because I'll just share this one story um, when, when I was asking the, the different ones, and I've just selected this one. And I'm not sure whether it was the last birthday or the one before, um, but they, they, you know, they, they got her looking really nice, they got her hair done, they got, uh, they'd put all of her makeup on, and she looked lovely. Uh, so Hilda said, well, why, 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 why are you doing this? You know, what's, what's this for? And they said, it's your birthday. I think it was the 94th or 95th birthday. And she said, never. Ooh, I'd better book a place at the crematorium then. <laughs> and it was just that, you know, that's how she was, you know, and that's, that's all of our fond memories uh, of her, really. Um, but, you know, when we, when we hear those testimonies of, of, of how God is, is continually in control, you know, I, I would just have to, to say he absolutely is. Uh, dementia and old age can rob us of all sorts of things. Uh, you know, it can take away our mobility, our, our, our ability to understand. Uh, for some people it can cause, uh, with dementia, it can cause great anxiety. But the one thing it can never do is to separate us from the love of God. And so it's, 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 it's a joyful time when we've got, you know, and, and it is so wonderful. It's a message the world really needs to hear because when somebody like Hilda passes away, yes, there is sadness. Yes, you will miss her. Yes, you will, you, you will feel that sense of loss. But you know it's temporary. You know that uh, through... Uh, the, the, sacrifice, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and Hilda's faith that she is now in a place where suffering is over. There's no more death, no more pain, no more suffering. And she looks forward to a glorious eternity and people will meet her again. So thank you for asking me just to share that short few words. Thank you, uh, Stephen. Well, I won't keep you too long. I'm just going to say a few things. Um, my memories of Hilda are quite similar. She appeared to be a very kind, outgoing spirit. She listened. She always took an interest in others. She asked questions, and then the next week you might see her, and she would follow on from the previous conversations, which was great, you know, because uh, you could build on things. You could build on conversations and get to know her in that way, and she back as well. She was a truly lovely lady from my experience, and quite a character too, as you say. Um, I remember with fondness her husband Howard too. Uh, he loved the English language, and uh, I went through a period of starting my sermon points with the same letter each time. It was alliteration, it's called. And after about a year of doing this persistently, most people got fed up of it, and quite understandably, and I stopped. But he loved it, and he always used to come and congratulate me and said, you carry on doing that. I love the English language. It's good that we've heard from Claiborne and Stephen as well. Um, we appreciate that care homes in these times of COVID have been especially difficult for care workers too and the residents and what they do and other places is quite remarkable the way they put themselves at risk those health workers 
day in, day out, for the good of others. Speaking of COVID, lockdown has caused many people to stop and reflect, to think about the big issues in life. Perhaps many of us were all too busy with daily life before, and then suddenly, for most of us at least, everything we took for granted and relied upon and trusted in began to dissipate. Perhaps it was our job. Perhaps it was just everyday comforts, money, health, other people, basic freedoms, physical interaction. That first lockdown was so new to us, wasn't it? It it seemed so alien then to normal life. It felt like living in an apocalyptic movie when I was walking the dog sometimes. Some kind of sci-fi dystopia. The whole world had grown to a halt. And as you saw one thing after another slipping away either from you or others, I wonder how you felt. Maybe you started off positively, thinking, well, this will soon go away. And as time went on, especially at that time when there was no vaccine, That light at the end of the tunnel seemed to get dimmer, not brighter. And so some struggled and still do with mental health. Others saw dear ones get sick. Some died. The young and not so young futures seemed to be disappearing before their eyes. And after a while, I think many began to feel a bit helpless and hopeless and unable to control anything anymore. The truth is, and I think lockdown has made it all too clear, is that we never did control our own destiny. We think we did, but we don't. We looked to our politicians to sort it out. They said one thing, then they said another. They're still doing that. They promised so much, they delivered so little. They always appear to be reacting to things instead of having some foresight and planning for things. They change their mind every so often. They're always on the back foot. They never seem to be prepared, at least in this country. And that has eroded our trust in our politicians and our leaders. And I bet at some point during all of this, most if not all of us have thought there must be more to life than this or what's really going on here or is this really all there is or or is this the rest of my life now our world has no answers just one lockdown after another that's no way to live it's no way to be human I wonder if you've begun to think during this time is there a God and if there is a God then Why does he let this kind of thing happen? And some perhaps begin to investigate and follow that thought through and others may push the thought away. You ever wondered why sometimes we push that thought away of God? If it was any other issue, we would gather as much information as possible so we can make an informed decision. But when we think about God, we often push him away or that thought away. We investigate everything else, but when it comes to God or Jesus, we often just don't give him the benefit of the doubt as we would every other issue. How do you know, though, if that's you, if you don't investigate? Yet why think about God at all? Well, the Bible gives us one of many answers. The Bible doesn't give us all the answers for everything, but it gives all the answers that matter. The Bible says this, Ecclesiastes 3.11, God has set eternity in the human heart, and yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. Is life really that we're born, we live a while and we die and that's it? The Lord blessed Hilda, didn't he, with a long life, 95 years. But is that it? Is that the end? Stephen alluded to the fact that it wasn't. 
And there is something in us that says, no, it's not the end. Maybe listen to that voice just at this moment. God has set eternity in your heart. You're meant to think about the eternal. You're meant to live beyond the grave. The soul, which is the real you, is eternal. That's why as you get older, I'm 58 now. I know that's not that old. But I always still feel young and ageless inside. Whereas outside, things are beginning to happen that make me feel that I'm not that. But inside, you're always young. Hilda was always young inside. We all are. It's outwardly that we are wasting away. God has set eternity in our hearts. And that's why in this life we often look for things that will last. That's why we spend our lives searching for the perfect partner. Searching for a good uh, and kind of hopefully a permanent way of life. That might mean money, family, pleasure a brilliant job that we get deep satisfaction from. We search for a sense of belonging, security, identity. Underneath, we're looking for meaning. We're looking for a deep satisfaction and a rock-solid security and a comfort and a joy that will last. We always want to be happy. We always want to know why we're here. Our scientists try and discover that all the time. Where are we going? Who we are? Identity in our societies is a huge thing now. It's really, really big. Who am I? And there's an awful lot of confusion. If we're honest, we spend our lives searching for all of these things in different ways with different people. Sometimes we think we've found that deep satisfaction that, if you like, eternal satisfaction. This is it now. But then it doesn't last. The novelty goes, it fades. And we're still left with the yearning inside for something more. Grief is the same, isn't it? Hilda was greatly loved and now she's gone, as um, uh, Jan uh, alluded to. Even the very people we love so much eventually leave us and we're left feeling hurting, maybe empty, sad. There must be more to life than just this. And you know, there is. Where does this yearning come from? God has set eternity in your heart. That's why Mick Jagger sang, I can't get no satisfaction. Because so many of us are trying to fill this huge eternal hole in the core of our beings with that which is temporary. Bob Geldof reportedly said, always, 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 without relief, there's this black hole inside And it never goes away. How telling is that? A man who's got everything this world can give him. Bono from U2 sings, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Why? Because this hole is a God-shaped hole, an eternal hole, and only the eternal God can fill it. The great C.S. Lewis said this, If we find ourselves with the desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that we were made for another world. That makes sense. Because God has set eternity in the hearts of everyone. You know, COVID has highlighted this so much. Never has there been a time where this is more urgent. Because COVID has stripped everything away. We may ask, what is God doing? He is removing all those things, all those people, 
all those ideologies that you and I have trusted in and relied upon and took for granted. Why? So that you may find your all, not in the temporary, but in the eternal, in Him. God has set eternity in the human heart. And then it says, yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. No one can understand it. Because we don't understand so often, and perhaps it's the first time we've realized it, that God has put eternity in our hearts. So we keep looking in the wrong places. I did for many years. And Freddie Mercury wrote, didn't he? Does anybody know what we're living for? Tell me, please. Freddie and perhaps so many of us don't realize that the only place to find that answer is to look at what has God has done from beginning to end. God has made a way back to him through Jesus. Hilda heard that message many times in this church. Perhaps you've heard it before. God became human in Jesus so that he could be one of us. Why? So that he could represent us and take our place and take upon himself all the wrong things in us that prevent God from having a relationship with us. Those things in you that stop you connecting with the eternal and allowing God to flood into the empty core of your being that was actually made for him and him only. And on the cross, God placed those wrongs upon Jesus. And instead of judging you for your wrongs, he judged Jesus. And Jesus died for all who come to him for forgiveness. And that forgiveness is simply a prayer away. Jesus rose from the dead. He stands ready to receive you, to receive me, to fill you with himself, to give you a brand new start a brand new heart, and a brand new life. It seems that Hilda, according to Stephen, came to realize that. How amazing. That the eternal one is living in the eternal core of you. I don't know about you, but in my past life, I tried absolutely everything that this world could offer. And I mean everything. And every single time, to me, it promised everything and delivered nothing and just left me even more empty and even everything else was even more futile and meaningless. I was always searching for the next thing until I came to Jesus. A year after that, it suddenly dawned on me that a year before, I had completely stopped searching. Why? Because I'd found my reason for being. I had found the eternal satisfaction. Why? Because that eternal hole in my soul was now filled not with the temporary, which cannot ever fill it, but with the everlasting. But this isn't about me. You too can call upon Jesus and end the search. You would be amazed. I wonder, will you give him the benefit of the doubt today? What's anybody got to use, to lose? He's either fake or he's real. Perhaps we could find out. Let me invite you, if you're interested at all, to, and I know you might not be, but if you are, that we have a course starting soon online for those who want to find out more about Jesus. You are very welcome to uh, be interested in that. Let me finish by this. Jesus says this. So I say to you, ask and it will be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. Thank you for listening. Well, we have been celebrating God's great faithfulness in Hilda's life, in our lives. And uh, we're going to um, watch another video song, Great Is Your Faithfulness. 
uh, we'll remain seated and uh, tap along or whatever you wish to do to this music. Great your faithfulness Oh God my Father Oh God my friend Your love it never fades And so I love you Until the end When shadows fall change from age to age you never change great is your faithfulness your faithfulness through the years you always been there great is your have seen on the order of service that um, donations to Claiborne would be much appreciated instead of flowers um, and uh, grateful thanks from the family too for all that have uh, everybody's done for Hilda I just need to give you a COVID announcement or two we, we have one toilet it's just there that we can use um, we have to leave um, the service table by table with social distancing 
and we have to leave immediately. I know it's not ideal, we wish we could be different, but that's what we have to do at the moment. So appreciate your um, cooperation in that. And thank you so much for coming, everybody. Uh, it's been a wonderful service from my point of view and a privilege to officiate at it. Um, we're going to close with um, the uh, last song, No One Ever Cared For Me Like Jesus. This is by Stephanie Kret Skret Gretzinger. And then as we exit, we will have pictures as we did in the beginning running. But uh, thank you so much for coming. It's great to see you all and meet you all. Amen.